Yes, this is an incredible anthology collection of photos of record collectors in their home studios or in, in their environments with their collections. All around the country, right? You hit every state. You, you, Almost. You, you guys said it all. Yeah. I should just shut up. Yes! Show's over, baby! Now you send me to the underground Cut my legs off and you stole my sound How the fuck am I supposed to... You are the author creator of Dust and Grooves, uh, and that's not the only thing that you have published. You've done a lot of interesting uh, collection books um, that are music oriented. And uh, when did you start? When did the first one come out? The first Dust and Grooves. All right. Well, thank, first of all, thanks for having me here. Yeah. 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 Thanks for um, coming. It's nice to listen to my voice. Yeah. <laughs> in this high tech <laughs> uh, environment. Um, when did I start Dustin Grooves? Let's see. Um, 2008. 2008. Yeah. I moved to the, uh, to the U.S., to New York. Um, and 2008 was a tough year financially. It was the, uh, um, the big recession here in, in, in the U.S. And I moved here as, a, you know, like coming to America. I uh, actually, country. same, same year. Oh, yeah? Yeah, I came in 2000 year, and it's pretty similarly, up. I came in like a bus with nothing. Same year here. Yeah. Really? 2008, and beginning I, of 2008. And I, and I was ready to uh, conquer the, uh, you know, New York as a photographer. You know, I had dreams of, uh, you know, just the American dream, I guess. And, uh, yeah, it didn't really work. <laughs> <with> that, <right? laughs> yeah. But uh, something worked. No, but, but that's the thing. It's, that's, that, that's a beautiful thing. So because nothing worked, it was the, the worst year ever for you know in initiatives and financially and no one was hiring i'm a photographer i came here to be you know so i just had to like justify my move you know like i sacrificed a lot moving out of my country and coming here and leaving my friends my family so i just looked for things to do and as a record collector myself back home I think one of the first things that I realized here, like, like that I really noticed is like the abundance of records and music, you know, New York, America, uh, especially New York, we still have record shops. Yeah. And that, that was 2008. So 2008 was like, like still, you know, like records, vinyl was not like hip and popular as, as right now. It was mm. still kind of like, you know, uh, I guess like at the end of the decline, perhaps like that, that process of moving to CDs and then MP3s was, you know, started like around the, the uh, I guess, early nineties. Right. And Late eighties. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, but in 2008, there was already kind of like, uh, I guess like a, like a underground movement of collect, I mean, collectors who collect rec like the record collectors that I documented in, in, in the first book were all, you know, um, the, for them, if you say there was a vinyl revival, they will laugh at your face. And like, what the fuck are you talking about? Because they've been there. Yeah, yeah they've, they've been, been there. It's almost, like an, it's almost like an insult for them. So, right. so it's like, yeah, we've been here all this time. And now everybody's like jumping on the, uh, I guess, like on a train. Let me ask you, before you came to the States, did you have a big collection? No. You didn't? So no. you started when you got here, because I was going to say that that would be pretty difficult. No, well, a huge I, I, collection of vinyl to ship. I had a record collection in it. Uh, I'm I'm from Israel, okay, and I had a record collection back then, and uh, I lost it. No, completely. how do you lose it? Something to do with parents and moving apartments, and we'll, oh. keep, we'll keep it at, at that. All right. Ouch. Yes. I remember when my CD book got stolen. I cried. God, I remember it was my dad SUNY telling Albany. It was my horrible. dad told me horror stories about you know all of his golden age comic books that he had like put uh. in wax. <laughs> he put in like wax paper, and then he came back from college, and mm. they had been dumped. It was like millions of dollars. Superman right? number one. Yeah, like Superman. Yeah. Spider-Man number one. It's, so, it's painful when you lose a big collection. Yeah. So my, my first record collection is somewhere, you know, I, I'm hoping, I was hoping that one senior citizen or a few <laughs> senior citizens were enjoying my, my collection. So yeah, so back to Dustin Grooves, I arrived to the US, I arrived to New York. I, I had plenty of time in, in, on my hands and, and then I started 
this project, like I just reached out to the one person that I knew, Cosmo Baker, he's a DJ from Brooklyn. Um, and he, and I asked him, hey, can I come in and take some photos of your record collection? And he was like, yeah, sure, man. I mean, and uh, that's how it started. Like, uh, it started like that. And then um, I guess the, the internet was at the stage of like blogging was like uh, the thing back then, you know, and, uh, and social media was just starting like Facebook. So, um, and I was like, during my travels, you know, like I used to travel a lot for work and like just travel as a, as a backpacker, as a, as a traveler and bring in stories. Um, so I used to do a lot of blo blogging back in the day. So I started this blog, I called it Dust and Grooves. And after a few photo sessions like that, like, um, I realized that I tapped into a, a community that was kind of like, you know, in a way hidden a little bit because everybody, like these people that were avid record collectors, they would collect records, but they, they always meet up, like they would meet up in a, in a record shop or in flea markets or record fairs, but then, but they never, they would never see each other's record rooms mm. and that was the project the project my kind of focus on this project was documenting record collectors in their own personal rooms and that was that was the uh, the, the, the focus and you need we, a lot of room to collect vinyl yes yeah <laughs> i've i've i stole basically you're, all you're of my parents i i stole all my parents records um but i was raised understanding the importance of vinyl like my dad as soon as i was born he was like i got a little friend now and i can show him all the zappa and stephen <laughs> wolf and all the, the steely dance the best production you're ever gonna get oh yeah and uh he and would go on and on and, to but i could never touch the albums and put them on the record player because i'd fuck you up get the your grubby little hands off of those and of course when you're told that all you want to do is then put on the record yourself and he had <laughs> right. b w uh speakers mm. really nice speakers and i remember i blew one of the tweeters he's like you blow my blow my speakers I'm like I, I, I didn't do anything he's like you fuck uh, yeah that was a big thing on average do you how, how what's like the size of a typical collection that you go check out like, is there a size or they really varied? Some people have like 100,000, some people have 10,000, some people have exactly. 100. <laughs> yeah. do, do people know their count? Um, is that, that would be pretty uh, it's OCD. Like, yeah, it's like estimated. And so honestly, I mean, at the beginning, when I started the project, I was a little bit like into that. I was like, I was chasing people with a lot of records. But it, wasn't, it, but it wasn't about that, you know, like it, it was never about the quantity, or, although when you want to have like a nice photo of, you know, plenty of record, like, you know, like if you want to uh, transfer the, uh, the, the craziness, you need like, you know, like it's better when, when you have a, a, a big collection. So you know was, you have I a was, big collection when you have a ladder to get to the top shelf. Yeah, <laughs> a ladder or, yeah, man, many other techniques. So, um, yeah, I mean, but, but, but I think after a while, after I got like, you know, a few profiles in and starting kind of like diving in, in deeper into the psyche of the mm. record collectors, I stopped caring about the size and it was more about like, okay, let's, you know. The story. Yeah, the stories behind the records, behind the people who collect them, you know, reasons why they collect them and kind of like, yeah. you know, having the, uh, the person, the collector as a curator, I guess. Yeah. You know, that's a word that I heavily used these days, but. Uh, <laughs> but, but I agree with you actually there. That's, that's, that's something that the term curator is pretty overused and it's hard to discover, you know, what meaning it has. Anymore. Yeah. But, uh, but that, that was kind of like the, the added value that I found uh, when I started, the, when I started putting this project together. What was it a blog initially? It yeah. was a blog first, right? Yeah. I mean, right? it started as a photo project. So yeah. just like, okay, I just want to have, nice photos of record rooms with with the collectors but then immediately like i like the the immediate feedback from the people was like hey check this out that check this one out right check this check the story about this and the, and and i realized like immediately these people were you know i'm talking to the experts <laughs> they're passionate and i should be listening and 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 put this everything down mm. on paper or on you know digital uh form so 
And that's how it started. And, um, you know, one led to the other. And, and the community started like, you know, like, oh, this is cool. I know this guy for like years. I've never seen his room. I've never seen him. Yeah. You know, I, I never really like got this interview. It's a nice little peek behind the curtain. Yeah. So, and, and that kind of like fueled the, 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 uh, the project. And after maybe doing this for like three, four years, I've decided to, to I mean, the, the, actually, the, the feedback from the community was, hey, they, you should make a book out of it. Yeah, and I, was not, I wasn't confident about this a, yeah. a, at all. Like, I was like, yeah, I don't know. Did you seek a publisher out or did you uh, try so, to DIY it, it? No, so at the beginning, I, the first move that I've done was to kind of like print. I, I was working in a, in a, in a studio, like mm -hmm. just a little bit like this one here. Oh, nice. And so I, I took like my favorite photos, nothing to do with like, you know, the content, just like picked my favorite shots and printed them and like, you know, by a five by seven prints mm. and I spread them over the table. And with that bird eye view of the project, I was like, yes, I got it. This is, this is going, this is going to be a, an awesome book. And that was just like the mid, mid, the midway, like, you know, like just like in the, the middle of the road. But in, from that moment on, I decided I'm doing the book. And then it was kind of like a roller coaster, an amazing roller coaster where yeah. I, I did a Kickstarter campaign and that kind of like blew up really fast. And, That's great. Uh, and then I traveled the world. I did a, a world tour. I did a, um, a 40 day road trip in the US. Ooh. Um, uh, you know financed by the uh, the kickstarter that we did that's great and we just traveled for 40 days intense traveling um, just going to check out other people's collections yep that's yep. so cool circle the u.s and um, that right. was in 2012 and in 2014 volume one dustin grew's volume one let me smell the book it's today well, if I had known, I would have brought a Man, cupcake. Man, that book smells good. Yeah. So, There's nothing like a new book smell. Yeah. So this is mm, volume mm, one, mm. but but it's uh, it's a tenth anniversary. So this is not the uh, the cover that everyone knows. It's, oh. it's a variation of it. Uh, this came out in 2014, and I guess the reason that we're here today yeah. is to also talk about the volume two. Sweet. Oh, it's even it's chunkier. Even it's, bigger. it's even, even bigger, ch chunkier, heavier, bigger, stronger. And, and I guess the idea with it was going and diving deeper. Wow. That is so, amazing. So this Did you one go underground for any collections? Is anybody like a bunker in a bunker? Like <laughs> not, not a bunker, trying to survive like a survivor like a nuclear bunker. war? They're like, my records are coming with me. I mean, I guess if you're a collector and you think the world's going to end soon, you would have a special collection for the bunker. That's true. Right. You <laughs> yeah. need the vinyl. You know the, the um, Library of Congress? No, mm -hmm. wait. The White House. Right. They have uh, a record collection. Oh, yes. oh that's awesome. Yeah, that's a, it's kind of like a rumor that... Uh, it's a rumor? It's, it's a rumor, rumor record collection? that's kind of like circulating that, you know, that when Obama went into office... I was just uh, about to say. He <laughs> was like, you know, a funky dude that, right. as he is. Yeah. He was like, oh, yeah, let's pull out the, uh, the collection from the, you know, from the basement. So that's the rumor. And I actually, when I had the first book out, I targeted him and I was like, okay... I need to get him. That's this the, is that true? I, I need to get him. So I actually, I took, I took a, 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 a book and my old roommate, she worked on his campaign uh. back then. And she hooked me up with like one of the uh, people in, in office, like one of her friends. And yeah, I sent, I sent him uh, a book. Uh, nice. Signed, signed and, and numbered. And I wrote him a letter like that. I would love to see his collection. If right. Yeah. And uh, I did get a reply from the White House, uh, like a formal reply. I have it in, uh, uh, <laughs> yeah, I have it at home. Nice. Uh, and it's more like, a, okay, thank you for your donation, blah, blah, blah. Right. And, right. Yeah. yeah but, That's cool. No, Obama was a cool uh, president like that because I got, I got to go to the White House uh, during his, the end of his presidency. He invited a bunch of people who ran like... Um, workspaces like they call maker spaces like mm -hmm. places like 3d printers art studio kind of vibe uh and he gathered uh that department something called the department of making which mm. doesn't exist anymore uh which was basically a, a department in the office of science and technology meant to 
um, promote independent like manufacturing, like local prototyping and and creating things here in the states. Like people are three D printing, you know, fake arms, like prosthetic arms, and getting them out to people. They really liked that. Uh, but they brought two of us from every state hmm. uh, together into this big conference right before he left office, and that got dissolved. Like that office got dissolved. Um, but yeah, the the White House record collection. It's like the Holy Grail, huh? I guess one so, day yeah. we'll get in there. I know. It. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, I mean, I don't know if you uh, if what you <laughs> saw that those memes of uh, Kamala Harris with the uh, with the records. Uh, I haven't seen the record one. Oh, uh, when she bought them and walked out onto the street. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I do remember doing. Yes, yeah, so there's a record store in DC. I forgot their name now, but uh, so she went in. I think it was like a year ago, and it was even before the, her campaign. You know, like she went mm -hmm. in to buy some records, and it was obviously it was filmed, and then uh, so then that came out, and it was really it's a it's a really cool video. You can see it everywhere on Instagram. But then when she uh, became the candidate. Everybody was using that photo of well, her. Well, I saw her with a showing record. a record, but yeah. then that was a meme, and right. they just everybody put was like, on "Yeah." It. I thought the one what that I we... saw uh -huh. it just showed her with a Gary Glitter's album. <laughs> it was Gary Glitter. Oh no! <laughs> so we have, like, if, if you scan the, the web, you'll probably see find like a hundred of these. Oh yeah, different variations of yeah. her holding yeah. different albums. I think the real one was Gary Glitter's, but uh, yeah. the, you know you can change if, it with Photoshop. If you had to guess one record from every uh, the past few presidents. Like, who, what do you think is in George W. Bush's record collection? <laughs> <laughs> mm, what do we guess? Mostly my solo music. It's just likely. all you. And hey, there's another one. Fan. I, heard, I heard these Yeah, fans. no, he digs my stuff. I would like to get him to show artwork here at Solace. Oh, yeah. There's, I, I do respect his paintings. The one of him in the shower and the dog. And I think I'm he did of, one of Arnold Schwarzenegger. I'm kind of obsessed with the bathtub one. The bathtub run, yeah. right? But I, I bet I, I wonder if a presidential record collection is. I hope that's a tradition that continues. I DM'd him. <laughs> I don't think Trump give, has a record collection. I, I no, I doubt it. I, he probably hates music. I, yeah, no, I, <laughs> he probably listens to only uh, Engelbert Humperdinck or something. I, I love and Engelbert I, Humperdinck. That dude has like <laughs> ninety albums. Yeah, he has so many albums, and every album cover is just a big picture of his face <laughs> with his okay. big beefy sideburns. That's a good move, though. Yeah, these books are beautiful. Yeah, they're gorgeous. Yeah, they're so amazing. So this uh, this is not out yet. Is this second volume? Yeah, no, the vol volume two is not out yet. It's it's Ooh. today. I mean, I don't know when this is going to be uh, aired, but the official publication date is October fifteenth, two thousand twenty four. Just coming up. That is coming up. Book drop and is happening soon. Everyone, yeah, keep your eyes open for this. Dustin Grooves. This is the real deal. If you're into music musician anything involved with music this is basically the holy grail of collecting albums yeah. yes so collecting records and uh you're you're, you're featured in it you, you didn't even ask me if you if, if you that's see. that's crazy you, you, you <laughs> i don't want a photo you're, i didn't want to see it like, oh, me, me, me. oh my god you haven't seen it I yet don't, I don't no he, he hasn't seen it oh, I'm we're, excited. Not, we're not gonna be oh, and you got like a little bit like of uh I mean, in your words, a little pervy. I know it's a provocative it's album. Pervy, <laughs> uh, Flash, right? The the album is called the the band is Flash. The one with the uh, with the tushy. Yeah, it's got a tushy. Yeah. So the the reason that Flash exists, I forgot. What, oh well. Well, we got, we're gonna. He's I mean, from we Yes. Can, we, we can show it in the back. I forgot. The yeah, guy's I got the name, green screen for that reason. Totally. Originally, the lead singer of Flash was uh, one of the guitarists in the early uh, formation of the band. Yes. I don't think he got along with anybody in the band. Different musical direction is what I heard, although Flash is almost identical to Yes. So it's a little bit confusing, but he, he wasn't uh, Yes. And the album is a little bit provocative. Basically, it's a, it's a girl's tushy. Oh. And her skirt's Co kind covered, of... Covered in... Well, a little bit. Yeah, no, no. It's... I didn't make the album cover. I'm a nice man. I, I'm not perv. That's... <laughs> It sounds pretty tame, honestly. Uh, it's, yeah, we yeah. have album covers of the. So I wanted to plug the. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I wanted to plug the, the book. So we said uh, publication that f October fifteenth, but on the twenty sixth of October, that's uh, Saturday. Uh, Saturday, Saturday, Saturday. What's going on? You having a launch party? Yeah, we're gonna have a launch party at yeah. Public Records. Yeah, very and nice. And you're gonna be bringing your I flash am gonna records, be right? Yeah. Yes, I am. Yeah, so we're gonna have like at least ten or twelve uh, of the local community, like the collectors from in the book from New York, are gonna be be there. You're one of them, and uh, we're gonna do a book signing and stuff like that, and just have fun. 
Yeah. And some free drinks, hopefully. So that sounds an awesome hey. time. We'll nice. definitely put all the info for that uh, below as well. So check that out if you've got yeah, the Yeah, Dustin Grooves, local so, lunch party, October 26th. With all your Beautiful. knowledge on vinyl, what would you say would be like the top Holy Grail five albums that like these record collectors like and they pull it out. It's like glowing. It's like, whoa. Are there any like records that you like? Oh, shit. You got that one. You get you gave me the uh, the the um, the the top most question <laughs> it's like the most asked question son of a bitch <laughs> yeah no you know what okay so the uh the answer for that like what was like i don't know man uh dude there are so many i mean it depends who you're talking to but um i feel like it's even worse than any other collectible because there's so much more music in the world than anything else yeah you know how can you even how can you even come close i mean maybe one one record that kind of like comes up all the time is like skull snaps Skull Snaps is a great, great album. Yeah, and, and it's cool. It's got an awesome cover. It's got but, skulls on but, it. But here's the thing. Like today, with where vinyl is, and this is something that we're actually dealing with in this book, mm. is the progression of the vinyl manufacturing, the vinyl collecting scene, uh, the explosion of vinyl in, um, in kind of like the mainstream world, in Instagram and on TikTok. Do you see that um, that account where the, they're making the records and they, uh, they there's a really popular account. I can't remember what it is right now. I'll have to do some research and put it back there. But their whole their whole social media is them creating the vinyl, like putting the color specs in mm. and pressing like you know different no, uh, designs. I haven't, I haven't, no, I haven't. I haven't noticed that. Oh, but, it's uh, cool. I'll send it yeah, to you. Okay, it's cool. like they're, all their content is just them actually pressing the vinyl. Makes you feel that like vinyl's got a pretty secure future uh, going forward. People are still into it. Do you think that's true? Do you think that it's um, gaining in popularity still? It's it's been gaining for yeah. years. Yeah, mm. of, uh, definitely in the in the past ten years, uh, even more than ten, uh, 10 years. And now, to me, it's a natural progress progression i guess mm. and uh i always say i mean I've, I've, i get asked that a lot like what's you know yeah, is it gonna how, be around how can you how do you explain the uh popularity of vinyl when you can stream everything yeah and i and i and back in the days of the mp3 i would say mp3 uh was the reason for the vinyl you know like mm. uh, yeah. uh, for the vinyl resurrection because people lost touch they want to yeah with the, physica with the tactile feeling with the physicality of of the objects or like the objects that carry the, the music for them so uh there's also um uh, a, a thing about coming back to like print is coming back yeah as well mm. um and um yeah i guess uh, speaking of print i want to ask you um did you lay this book out as well did you like the graphics, like you know, like laying it out? No, I, I rather I rather have the professionals. Yeah, do that. So <laughs> it looks great. Yeah, no. So with the first book, did you have Brian Shevlin lay this out? That's what it looks like. <laughs> oh, who's that? Uh, a friend of mine uh, who uh, you might actually know uh, what Brian. So he was the guy who started Con Artist Collective on Ludlow Street. We talk about that a lot, but he w was the guy who laid out um do you know tape op magazine yes yeah so he did that oh nice and i didn't know that for when i started working for him i was in this gallery and uh you know i thought he had a cool art collective or whatever and he told me his story but he was like at a record a and r guy uh working at uh different uh and then working as a manager at, like different nightclubs before he started this art collective and then <laughs> about a, like two or three months into working for him he was telling me more stories about his, his like career and his past work and he mentioned that he was like one of the people who laid out tape op and i was like oh my god i love yeah, that that's, a, that's a great magazine yeah yeah that's still going right this is yes still around. They yeah. actually they uh, reviewed my previous book that you oh, created the uh, the cover which i am honored uh, yeah vintage and rarities so yeah great. tell yeah. us about that book too because basically you you don't just have dust and grooves you have uh portables over here yeah Oh yeah, uh, we which did, we is, did. is portables part of the series? Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful book. Yeah, it is. yeah, so portables. It's more portable too. It's smaller. It's, it's kind of like a side project, like a, a companion book to Volume Two. Mm. And uh, while I was traveling, because I, I worked on Dustin of Volume Two for about five, four years, four and a half years, and while traveling and documenting, like I traveled all over the world, I met all these collectors and some of them had portable players now 
to preface that, let's go back into 2020 when I published Stumbox book and Vintage and Rarities that were shown here in the back on, right? Yeah. Such a cool, cool book. Yes. Yeah, I so, mean, of course, I'm, we're both biased. So <laughs> that, that book came amazing. about as, when I finished volume one, I was like looking, okay, like, let's see what's the next thing that I can do, what other projects I can, you know, tap into. So I went into, uh, uh, the, the project was about documenting uh, the pedals, guitar pedals of the world's greatest guitarists. Yeah, and if you're a guitarist or a musician, again, like this book is for you. It is an amazing, colorful book with histories of, of pedals you've never seen or heard of, yeah. and, uh, or you may have uh, seen and heard what's of them. The, what's and the weirdest them? pedal you have or you, that you've ever owned? Uh, I had a, I I had a really Russian. Went, I had a rat, fuzz. but that's rat. not really. That's, that's not, not. That's, that's yeah, not that's crazy. Very common. Yeah. yeah, it's a common yeah. one. I had a pretty common one too, but I liked it. It was the big Russian big muff distortion. Oh yeah, you know, like the that's old, nice the old like Soviet looking metal. Yeah, something. Yeah, that thing was cool. So you you play as well? You play a little music? No, I mean no? I play the bass a little bit, but I wouldn't say I wouldn't say that I'm a player. But that but doing that book about guitar guitar effects was not. It wasn't because I, w I was like, uh, um, it, it, I did it as a fan of music and, and, and a visual artist. And how it connects to this book is that it, it was kind of like the same sta state of mind, like working on one major project and then doing another kind of like companion book. I mean, so this is the companion book for Dustin Grooves Volume 2. Uh, and it basically features uh, 222 vintage um record players wow portable players sorry yeah. so everything with a handle it could you have anything to have with a handle. handle yeah does it have one of the you've seen those little things that like drive on your record the oh little, yeah the, the, the record killer yeah the record killer we have three of these <laughs> here uh and the reason they call it the record a record killer is because they they will kill your records yeah they scratch them up yeah, right? yeah so real bad. but these so these ones would you say that's the worst record player <laughs> probably yeah probably so so these these uh these portables were sourced by from five different collectors that are all most of them are in volume two wow um and it's a really fun one yeah really cool i have a my parents still have a victroller from the early 1900s and my dad's like you're gonna get this when i die and I'm like, awesome. Wait. <laughs> is that like I hand got cranked? Edison. Oh, yeah, it's a hand cranked. Yeah. Hand cranked one. Wait, wait, hold on. I think we, yeah, here we go. Ooh, Beautiful. there we go. Yes. This Look still at that. is considered a portable. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but what, what was that? Uh, I'm sorry for this question. What was your I'm, first I'm, record? My first record? Yeah. Oh, no, that's actually a good, a, a good one because I remember, because uh, it, it's clear, you know, it's right. a clear answer. Uh, I got it at the age of nine. I lived in Mexico City back then for a year. Uh, it was a year of exploration for me because I was like everything was brand new, and uh, I bought it in uh, in a supermarket, like like a big supermarket chain, Gigante, it's called, and like giant. And I remember I used to be I used to be a, a swimmer, like like in the swimming team, and eventually after a while living in Mexico City. My mom got tired of like driving us um, to the uh, to the swim club every day, so she she just sent us by bus. You imagine nine year old in Mexico City, yeah, in Mexico <laughs> City, drive taking the bus and crossing a highway, Spicy. And, and and then and then switching to another bus just oh to get. Yeah, so uh, I did that, but then you know I was like, oh okay, there's this huge. Uh, gigante. It's, it's almost like a Walmart. So just in front of the. Uh, Swimming club. So I went there and uh, started like browsing. And uh, my first record was a Paul McCartney, Pipes of Peace. Which is nice. a cool, it's, it's a cool record, you know, for a nine year old first yeah. record. It had a song with, uh, it had a song with um, Michael Jackson that I was really The girl, into. is it The Girl Is Mine? Or uh, was it the other one when he drinks the strength uh, liquid and he beats the guy in arm wrestling? What? <laughs> well, no, yeah. the girl is mine is there, but that's not with, with Michael Jackson. No, it is. 
Is it? And and Paul McCartney gets into a fight with Michael. He's like, no, Michael, I think she likes me. He's like, oh, I think you're an idiot. She, she, if the girl is mine. And he's like, <laughs> so I what, don't think so, Michael. So what's that, so what's that song say, say, Yes, say, that's the one where they're like, you know, Linda McCartney is with him. And, and oh. yeah, that's a good, that's the one that, that in the video, like, there's a guy, a snake oil salesman, who's, uh, which is Paul McCartney. And uh, him and Michael Jackson are in cahoots, and he drinks this tincture, and then he beats this guy in arm wrestling, and then everyone wants to buy the tincture, and then they get out of the town, and they start singing with each other. <laughs> right. right. But they are, but the guy's a plant. Right. And then, of course, you know, Michael bought out all the Beatles. Uh, yeah. <laughs> right from I was going to mention McCartney that. Paul Didn't he, he tell him to do that, essentially, though, right? He was like, oh, Michael, you should uh, get he? into music rights. That's how we make money. And he's like, Whoops. oh, yeah, great. I'll, I'll buy all the Beatles. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think they were. I don't know if they were mad about it. I don't, I don't think. I think he was a little bit pissed actually. Was he? No. Yeah, and I think Sony owned the rest, but I think mostly it's owned by McCartney by now. Yeah, oh. yeah. Oh my Mine God. was um, uh, the heavy metal soundtrack, oh. and I got it from uh, Crazy Eddie's. Nice. <laughs> Mine's really embarrassing. Uh, I was a little bit older than I maybe should have been for my first album, but it was a Batman Forever soundtrack. Wait a minute. Is that Seal. the one? Oh, it's sealed because yeah, the first Batman album <laughs> is all prints. Right, right, right. Which is an amazing. If you never heard the first uh, Batman album, that's a great freaking album. That's cool. Oh, you mean uh, you mean the the new? Um, no, like, the old the the one with Michael Keaton. Prince did all the music. Yeah, yeah. But you know, Batman goes way. Oh, back of to, course, yeah. of course. Adam so West. There, there is a garage rock. Uh, version i guess not a version like a title for right Bat for the beginning of batman batman <clears throat> yeah you shake a little bit you're like at the beach <laughs> kicking up sand can, can i hijack the uh the, the beatles um yeah. uh thread here yeah. so yeah you were asking me about like favorites and stuff like that yeah. so it's I, I wouldn't say it's a favorite but it's definitely uh one of the features that gained the most comments mm. on the dustin grooves website mm was about an artist, um, his name is Rutherf R Rutherford Chang. Rutherford Chang. Yes, and he's a, he's a conceptual artist, and uh, he did, a, he, he, back then, he did, uh, he, he did this like installation, I guess, where he opened, like, the show was a record shop that only has the White Album in it. Uh. Right, and he would collect and ask people to send him the white albums, only the ones that were numbered, you know, because because oh. they made like a, a million copies of like numbered, right? Just a million, you know, like the others are. So there's like a million numbered um, um, white album uh, uh, records. So he's trying to get all of them. <laughs> yeah, and he's 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 basically yeah, like like let's ha let's see how many I can get. So the whole show was you know racks it, it looked like a record shop and it was all racks of like the white album but the right. interesting thing about it is because because it's a white canvas yeah everyone was different every record was different like people would do on it there, there would be like stains like water stains because uh, they're all uh, like, um, so secondhand. each one of them had uh you know its own life i guess right because you know evidence of the previous owner and he did a really good job uh presenting it and oh. you know like you know talking about it as a conceptual artist and uh That's it cool. was uh it, it, it was a great great well, great installation and that that feature is on the dustin grooves website you can go and see v photos of that so but so that feature got like i don't know you know usually we get like two three ten comments per per feature and per interview this one was like you know maybe 500 or something that's awesome. Yeah, it was crazy. Was there any like a discourse about were people loving it? They were loving the art. Oh yeah, so, yeah. some of them were loving it. Some of them like you know like the hardcore collectors back then was like, hey, this is bullshit. I mean, he's not. He, he's not in it for the music. Right. right. I mean, like, yeah, of course he's not in it for the music. That but, reminds but it's, me. It's a different thing. Right. When they did, they remade the VHS shop, and it was just Jerry Maguire. Do you remember that? Oh. It was an installation well, where the, the only Titanic. movie you can rent was Jerry Maguire and, <laughs> and just only Jerry Maguire posters. Do you, do you know about the Titanic guy? <laughs> no. There's a guy whose his goal, his life goal is to get a, as many copies of Titanic on VHS as possible. He's got a room with like 13, like maybe 1,300. And he's still a already, virgin. And he's still, yeah. he's still, <laughs> still collecting yeah, it. Yeah, I, I, I get to meet quite a few people like that, you know, uh, and, it's, and, and it's interesting, you know, like... Um, 
for example, for volume one, um, there's, a, there's a person here in New York that um, is a head of a label, music label, and he, his goal is to create like, almost like a Noah's Ark of oh. music. So he tries to collect two clean mint copies of every Jeez. recording. Like of, every of recording period? I, every I, vinyl I, release? Yeah, I guess. Like, but in, in, that, in that state, you know, of like, of like mint reco recording right. and uh, two of them. And he's got like, yeah, like million, I mean, over a million records. I would assume so. Yeah. And that's a big room, huh? So that's, so that's one side of like one. You're going to need a whole book just for that guy. Yeah. But then on the, uh, on the other end of the spectrum, uh, for volume two, I met up with a guy in Brazil mm. And he's like a um, kind of like a transportation mogul in Brazil, like wealthy person. And if you if you think that you know having million records is an obsession, this guy is, his name is Zero Freitas, and uh, I tracked him down after reading about him on uh, on the New York Times. So he had back then he had six million records. Oof. So. Where does and, he, and then you he had his yourself. own warehouse, I guess. Obviously. So he, he's got warehouses. He lives in, he lives in Brazil, <laughs> right? And he just he just can't handle all these records, and he mm. sh he he ships them bulk from from the U.S. and from other countries, and he just has this kind of like really unexplained obsession about mm. collecting and accumulating. He's got go a good, you know, uh, I guess. Um, goal i guess i don't know how even like a, like uh like he wants to get these all archived mm. but he knows that it, it will never happen <laughs> and it's quite knows, a monumental he knows, task he's, no he's, he's like self-aware like he, yeah, he's right. aware like i'm i'm buying f faster and uh, th than i can handle like yeah. more, like more than the I can... act of purchasing and collecting yeah, so, became so part always, of the obsession it's always accumulating and there's this like famous photo on the new york times where he stands on the on on a huge uh, pile. Pile. I mean, like you know, like stacked. Wow. Palletized uh, boxes of records. Jeez. Um, so yeah. So that's talking about obsession and kind of like you know keep getting stuff. Um, that that was probably the ex the, the the most extreme, um, I guess, uh, example of that. Yeah. Another album that just came to mind that people used to talk about all the time uh, was Stark Reality. Yep. I remember people used to talk about that being also a really hard to obtain album. Very cool music. It's not for everybody. I, I like it, but I guess it was meant to be like a children's album. But it turned yeah, but out to weird, be more uh, of a very intense, yeah. well put together with amazing musicians. But yes, Stark, yes. Stark Reality is a very interesting album. And you know, uh, it's funny. It's like yesterday, I, uh, you know, I, grew up in, I grew up in Israel. So for me, like, you know, Peanuts and like was not, it wasn't like, a, it, w it wasn't big in Israel. But uh, I, I knew how big it was here. Right. But specifically on, like, you know, record collectors were into it. And I was like, I didn't really understand why. And uh, Peanuts? Yeah. Like, yeah. like, like, like the, yeah. the cartoon? Yeah. Like, yeah. Linus is my favorite. But then when you see the, um, the, 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 the I just, I just call it like the, 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 the intro. Yeah. It's all like super jazzy, it's funky true. stuff. And they had that little on. dance so they do. I guess I guess that's kind of like one of the uh, the reasons that it's like associated with record collectors. Right. That's that's really interesting. I've yeah. never yeah, I've never heard but that. But I don't know. I mean, this is not this is not official. It's just my <laughs> observation. That's cool. Right. Do you right. feel like um that your kind of you're collecting collectors now? <laughs> you know, yes. you're putting a, <laughs> yeah. a bind. Has that like uh supplemented and taken uh, the place of your own personal record collecting or is it like made it even more uh intense for you do you want to collect even more no, records I mean, now I, I mean i'm i i i say this in in the in the preface of the first volume mm. like i'm just i'm just a, a casual collector mm. i've always been like i've always yeah. been into music and i hardly ever obsess about specific records sometimes i do yeah and I, and then I get them, or I wait until I until they find me. But I'm not I'm not like, I mean I'm not wealthy. And today, records are expensive. Yeah. Uh, so I always buy 
the cheap records. Like I always, I, I would always go into the you know, the one dollar bin, two dollar bin. That's a favorite, and that's kind of like a favorite thing for me, like finding the good stuff over there. Or thrift stores, <laughs> if you never yeah, know. Yeah, thrift stores, record shops. I mean, yeah, it's great. I love it, but uh, it, it's it's hard to find, uh, you know, stuff that is like decently priced well, because, because because also because of the, the, the internet you know ebay discogs right they can uh, just look it up they go oh i know someone's going to pay 42 dollars for this one yeah so, so let's it, it put completely it for changed the uh the, the world of record collecting and yeah. digging you know and um wfmu record fair is coming up i think so oh, that's true ooh. november first and second i think yeah oh, i yeah. have never been which is a you shame should, because it's amazing i'm gonna be there with these books excellent oh, perfect. um yeah it's a great thing i mean I've, i photographed probably around 300 record collectors that's amazing in these two volumes wow. and um so i've seen quite a bit and and, and a few you know a few a f different vari variations you know different motives uh one guy that really stood out, I mean, and it's funny, it's like I'm, I always, I, is, is a guy from France, his name is Patrice, and he made a book, he made an entire collection. Um, he started collecting records that are defaced, ah. like record covers, just the covers. That, I mean, he's a record collector, like a, like a, a genuine record collector. He's got a weird niche. But he's got a, his own thing about uh, looking for uh, record collector who, that are uh, record covers that are totally defaced or like just like like slightly defaced, and when when you put these together, you know, as a, as a compilation, it's just fascinating. Like you, you, you see how people are, you know, like you see you, you get into like people's it, um, I guess psyche, and it's it's almost like uh like art brute, you know, like like a peasant art. Yeah, and and it's such a it's such a great project. So that's another one, another interview that we have on the website that people can just go and Gotta take check a look. That out. But it's 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 a really cool, really cool feature that I really oh, love. That's cool. Definitely I would, check it out. <clears throat> I would say growing up, my favorite album cover, and again, you know, like my dad was really into Zappa, but Overnight Sensation mm. album cover. I don't know if you're familiar with it. It's a painting. Um, with a lot of hidden little things going on. You can look at it, it's like Hieronymus Bosch. How do I say it? Sorry. Hieronymus Bosch? Hieronymus Bosch. Yes. Hieronymus. <laughs> Basically like that. And that that's always been a, an amazing album cover for me, art-wise. That know. definitely I think, I think has inspired talked, I me. I think we talked about it on your in your interview. I'm guessing that you're going to be doing a, a Dustin Grooves 3, 4, 5, 6, all the way up to 69. Dude, this is a good question. Mm. Actually... You're never no. going to stop. No. 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 Well, here's the thing. So I self-funded this, this project. Wow. And it kind of like shifted my whole career, career into, from, from being a, you know, a photographer for hire into a micro publisher. This is like something that I, uh, so a micro publisher is like a publisher that publishes a book once in a few years. That's my definition of it. Mm. I'm not a, I'm not a small publisher. So, um, Mm -hmm. And um, and you're asking me if I like you know I I I always said after I finished the first book, publishing it myself, self publishing it, uh, investing all the money in it. I said next one, the next book, I'm only I'm only doing it if I'm getting a, you know like a financial backing for it. And I was waiting for it, waiting for it, and I was shooting here and there, you know, like sporadically, and it never it never it never happened. And then I don't know what what I don't know why, but I kept going. And then yeah. there's volume two, and I keep saying I'm not gonna do it if I'm not getting paid for it. Right. Uh, so I get I guess what happens I just got dragged into this like publishing world, which is really exciting. It's scary as shit because mm. I'm. It's a gamble. Know, it's a gamble, yeah. And I'm putting and I've put, I put I went all all in in this project. Like I in doing the 10th uh, anniversary uh, edition the uh, 4000 copies of volume 2 the portables book the box set it's a huge investment and uh you know i mean it takes a little bit of being a masochist a little, little bit, bit. A little but, bit but i be i believe in it i believe in this book i believe in the quali the quality the presentation um i believe that i'm a, a good enough photographer to uh i agree to present this uh this world but also 
uh, I guess I always had high standards for like details and production value. So it definitely shows in this volume, you know. So tell them where they can go and get it. Dustingrooves.com. Dot com. No Amazon. No Amazon. Not on Amazon. Do See you later, Jeff. The first book came out. I made two thousand copies. It got sold out in the in the in the book launch. During the book launch, we, wow. we ran, ran out. So immediately, I was like, "All right, let's do another edition." Yeah. And I reprinted it. We added Questlove to the second edition because he, he wouldn't do it for the first one. Uh -huh. But then when it, the but first he saw one it sold out, the, <laughs> the first one came out, he was like, "Oh, there's a is there a book? Uh, yeah. Is there a book about vinyl collectors?" And I'm not in it. Uh, I was like, "Oh, well, you know." <laughs> Well, there you uh, go. We chased you for a while. Uh, so we added him to the second edition. And then when we did the second edition, there was a publisher, big publisher, 10 Speed Press. Mm. It, it's a division of Random House, the, the biggest publisher in, in the US. And uh, they found the book and they bought the rights from me. Like they, they, they yeah. Oh, and okay. So, uh, and that was great. And kind of like I had to, you know, step up my game i had to get like a like a a, a rep you know like a like a, a literary agent to deal with the uh, with the publisher and uh we we did a deal we made a deal and they bought the rights for the first volume did they end up putting it out oh yeah of course yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah and they sold thirty thousand copies amazing amazing right yeah now how much money how much how much of that did i see huh. Very little. Oh, no, we're no. not gonna get into the into <laughs> yeah, the numbers, but like, uh, but you know, figuring figure, figure figuring this out, I was like, huh, okay, this is. I mean, it's 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 great because you know, the book goes out to many many people, so they have they have a way of distributing it, publish, uh, uh, promoting it, right, getting it into the right places, but the margin for them is very little, and yeah. obviously the author is even. Yeah. Um, so it's kind of like a, tr it's, it's almost like a double edged sword. And I did the same thing with the Stompbox books. Yeah. But then I realized, okay, this is it. It's like, I, this, it doesn't make any sense, mm. you know, because I put all the work, I put like my life into it, like p promotions, you know, I put all this, all this money, and then comes a publisher and they, they know, take I, it okay, all. Yeah. So, with this, with this book, with these, with this round, I I just went all independent, and that's what I was saying. Like I was putting all my everything. Like I, 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 but you I, still I, went, I went the rights I, to the I went name all and everything. You know. Yeah, yeah, the rights. I mean, this is this is all me. And so this they have is just the first volume. Just the first volume. Yeah. 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 But the right, the, the name is 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 Dustin Grooves. That's mine, and no one's gonna take it from me. Right. Uh, but what I'm saying is. Uh, when I decided to put these ones out, um, I put these on on Amazon uh. as placeholders. So basically, I'm I claimed the uh, ISBN number right. on Amazon, like uh, the, the the catalog number on Amazon. So if you go to Amazon right now, you'll see it. Does it say sold out? No, it it says it says <laughs> even even this is a, this is a, a message that I put like oh, this yeah? book is not going to be available on Amazon for a while. Ah. Go support. Go the, see uh, DustinGrooves.com. Yeah, support. Yeah, the the offer. Smart. Buy it from Dustin Grooves or your local record store, which is also important. Oh yeah. Because we we I do use distributors to get into the record stores. Great. To get these into record stores, into bookstores, but uh, Amazon is kind of like the last resort you know like the mm -hmm. and it's not going to be available on amazon for a while it will be eventually right maybe if i if i decide to do a second edition or what what you you would call a trade edition trade edition would be right maybe a little bit thinner paper uh the the whole purpose is that it's a little bit cheaper mm -hmm. um so if I decide to do it if there's going to be enough demand for it I, I might do it and then I will put it on on amazon yeah but uh, yeah, Isn't before you go to Amazon buying books or records and stuff like that, think about how much um, the other side, the, the, the actual creators, the authors, the musicians, they need your support. So try to, try to buy it directly or locally. It's not what I think, I know, print is back, mm -hmm. uh, magazines are, are back, um, uh, now I manage as as an independent publisher. I managed to get 
a really nice deal with uh, a high-end magazine distributor. Uh, and they're going to be uh, distributing these books into bookstores uh, worldwide, which is probably one of the biggest hurdles for small publishers is to yeah. get the dis distribution that, that, uh, uh, that actually doesn't rip you off. Right. So otherwise you're going to be calling everybody yourself. <laughs> yeah, which is which is what I'm still doing, yeah. but uh but less, you know, it's now that, that I have this this distribution channel, it's very it's like the sky is the limit and it's, it opens Beautiful. it up. So I'm, yeah. I'm excited to see more Dustin Grooves in the future. I want to thank you so much for joining us today uh, and sharing this with us. It's an amazing book. Go check it out. Go grab one from dustingrooves.com. Volume 2 here. This Forward is by this the is... Rizza forward by prince paul here prince paul and yeah. number two amazing stuff thank you so much for being on the show thank you guys for joining us check us out on patreon if you like the show give us a like give us a subscribe say what up bye